So why are Rooster Mill watches so expensive? Well, I got my trusted RM expert in-house and he's gonna tell us, so stay tuned to find out. All right, Adrian, so over the last, let's say three to five years, Rooster Mill market specifically has really exploded in popularity. Mm -hmm. What in your opinion or your perspective has contributed to Rooster Mill watches being so expensive? The reason for their success ultimately is they are the best marketers in the business. And for whatever reason, that specific brand caught fire with all markets, starting with the Asian market, the Dubai, uh, the Arab market, the European market, as well as the uh, United States market. I never had experience, you know, handling or seeing Richer Mill watches, right? We've had, you know, 6501 split second chronographs, for example. We've had a number of different ones with, you know, alternative case materials and TPT and the likes. Really, Richer Mill were the pioneers. And lest we forget, a lot of their tech comes from Renault and Poppy, right? Which is now owned by AP. And there's no denying, in my opinion, the technical side of things, right? As much as we may say, okay, yes, they have amazing advertisement and all this stuff. You know, when the RM001 was, was first invented and launched in the market in 2001, it was the first tourbillon of its kind that was actually shock resistant. So you are right in that. And there's nothing against their engineering or their movements or anything like that. But there's two types of people. There's some, there's, there are people that love the watch and there are people that don't love the watch. I remember when I first started in this business, the whole hype was uh, AP Concepts. Yeah. Okay, right? So the AP Concept one was pretty much the uh, the godfather to Richard Mille. Correct. So you had these incredibly, incredibly sporty watches that were essentially racing machines on the wrist. That's how they market themselves. Right. Richard Mille kind of tapped into that market, the concept market, and I started to see a lot of concept people switch to Richard Mille. First off, the watch is far, far, far more comfortable than any type of concept. Mm -hmm. and. And then I noticed trends in terms of uh, overall popularity in the Asian market. It was right around 2016 where we really just started selling them like very, very hot and heavy. And uh, there was a guy in Indonesia I used to deal a lot with, and I asked him very specific. I'm like, "Hey, what you know? What's going on here?" And his response was, "Richard Meals, due to the lack of supply of the pro of the product, is a hedge against our dollar's currency." And that's what the bottom line is. They would have rather had Richard Meal money parked in Richard Meal than in their currency because their currency was so volatile. Which is pretty incredible to think about, right? I mean, it, it really was almost the precipice of the idea of watches as kind of a store of value as yep. before, like it was thought of, right? Because if you go back five years, you know, watches as an investment was, I mean, I don't think anybody was talking nobody about Nobody was watches. talking about it. Right, nobody was really talking about it, or at least a store of value or things of that nature, right? So it, it really was, in some cases, you know, an investment watch before the term investment watch, what was it, right? And, and you mentioned kind of Formula One, which is uh, something that I actually wanted to talk about, right? You talk about racing machines on the wrist. Again, we, we already mentioned, for example, the engineering of their pieces, the use of alternative materials, even just for example, in the case, the ergonomics, the way it wears. I think all those factors also played into the price, right? Because listen, a watch has to have a certain pull as well, right? Because of if course. you're investing your dollars into it, I think you have to have a feeling that when you put it on wrist and you see it you know yep. there you're like okay damn this is you know this is pretty damn good yeah i mean a lot of a lot of uh richard meals clients they are not as uh as i like to call them uh horology nuts like like you are right <laughs> yeah. they aren't buying the uh movement behind the watch right you know back in the day there used to be a saying uh the million dollar handshake or the billionaire boys club that's what richard, richard meals associated to and from then on it just kind of caught on they make it damn near impossible for you to walk in and buy what you want I mean, they only make nowadays, I think roughly two to 3,000. More, more. They make more now, I Potentially, think. Potentially, yeah. right. But at least uh, at least what, we've, what I've seen online is about two to 3,000, maybe closer to five nowadays, let's say, um, but still extremely limited. And they've only been around since 2001, right? So to say yeah. like a brand that's only been around 21 years is now completely sold out and their watches sell at you know, almost two X multiples and sometimes sometimes, even, sometimes, sometimes even, higher. even higher, right? It, it's just unseen and unheard of. <laughs> I mean, of. yeah, I've, I've, I've seen the trend of these watches. I've seen the growth rate by far just exponentially more than any other brand. Yes, we've seen Rolex and AP and Paddock and some models just go into just into the stratosphere and just prices that just don't even make sense. But when it comes to Richard Mille, when you have 30,000 of the most in-demand watches for the whole entire global market, you're talking about 3,000 watches or 3,500, whatever it is, for the richest people in the world, wealthiest yeah. clients in the world, 
That's the whole point of it. People want what they can't have. Right. How do you see the Richard Mill market kind of playing out, right? Do you still see uh, it being, you know, kind of a little bit everywhere as we're seeing it now? Do you see kind of the really rare stuff still progressing and still, you know, being yep. rare in, in five years from now? What, what are you seeing, for example? It's a good question. With with Richard Mill, the whole their whole entire market and uh, the uh, demand for their product really. Uh, depends on the distribution. Mm -hmm. So Richard Meal has three or four different di distributions. They have the Americas, which consists of Canada, United States, and South America. Then you have Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa, which is distribution center number two. And then you have Asia, which is distribution center number three. And I believe Japan may be its own separate distribution center. So it really depends. There are guys at the forefront that will say, hey, this watch belongs here, right? Okay. It's not a random sequence of events. Right. So it all depends on how many watches or, or what actual product they put out there on the market. Now, I will say this, although it is probably, it is my second favorite brand to protect Philippe. I love Richard Mille. When I wear it, I'm wearing an RM28 rose gold right now. In my personal opinion, the past, I would say three, four years has actually been my least favorite uh, Richard Mille releases onto the market, if that makes sense. So let's talk about the 6501s. That is now, it's not their gold standard chronograph like the, 11, the RM11 was, and then that followed with the 1103. Right. The 6501, although it looks very similar to both of them, it's a split second. Right. So that's not marketed as their uh, gold standard chronograph, the 7201 is, yeah. right? That's their first in-house, I believe, their first in-house chronograph. It is completely different look to the 1103 and 11. Okay, going back to the 6501s. The problem with that watch is, and if you're seeing those watches on the market now, for the first time in a long time, they're actually trading for around MSRP. Right, which is unseen of in the last yeah. five, and I'll five explain, or so And I'll explain years. to you why. Besides the ladies. And I'll explain to you why. For whatever reason, they decided to oversupply them onto the market. So do you think it's too much supply or people just aren't it's holding a, it, onto them? It's always a, it's always, it's always a supply, supply for me with Richard Mille. When the 1103 started to drop, they were damn near impossible to get. They made them in a lot of different variations. They made them in rose gold, rose gold, titanium. They made them in titanium. They made special editions such as the 1103 McLaren. Uh, which you know, which was a huge marketing success. You know, the the idea behind that was, you're able to, to buy a uh, 1103 McLaren at MSRP, which at the time I believe was about one hundred eighty thousand dollars, if you got allocation of the McLaren Senna. I don't want to call it stuff, but but marketing genius, and it really worked. Plus, the watch was was spectacular. Nobody's ever right. seen a tiger stripe before. It was yeah. black and orange, yeah. and it and it just it, it really did well. Then you had the 1103 Jean Jeanteau, which was blue. They never seen a, an NTPT material with with a blue color in it. That took off like crazy. So anytime pieces like that take off, their counterparts take off as well. That being the 1103 black all NTPT, the 1103 red QTP, and, and their other pieces. For whatever reason, their current chronograph line and current split second line just did not follow the same trend. Right, but I think you can also say this uh, kind of for Richer Mill in general, right? Which is when they do off the beans pass stuff, like the, the price on the secondary market is nowhere near what their alternative materials fetch, which is crazy, right? Because they're more or precious or semi-precious metals versus something like a carbon, right? Which is, oh, you know, it's just yeah. pressed together yeah. sheets of carbon, absolutely. which is not as, you know, spectacular. And yet it's far the, more collectible. The, the, <laughs> it's almost like the less precious metal you have in the watch, the more expensive. <laughs> which right? is crazy, right? So I don't that's, think we've ever that, seen that. That's part of the whole allure of Richard Mille, you know, especially I remember when they released the 6702. So the 6702 is, is the, uh, I guess, successor to the 6701, but they made it in NTPT materials. When that watch first hit the market, it was the running joke of the entire industry from a wholesale side of things amongst us dealers to the retail side of things. Right. Fast forward years later, it is the best holding value Richard Mille Currently today, which is like crazy, from from its absolute peak yeah. to the market on them today is as stable as it could possibly go. Because I've seen 1103s, I've seen 6501s, I've seen 7201s, which is like the most popular pieces, really, really tank in price over the past year. I would say ever since crypto started dropping, they took a nasty, nasty fall. The 6702s, I'm not saying they went up in value, but they have been pretty stable because people people associate that with minimalistic extremely sporty FU money. And that's what it is. You're essentially wearing a very thin piece of plastic on a hair scrunchie and you know it's $300,000. So that's the other part of Richard Mille. I, when, when I explain it to a, a new customer, when they come in, why is this watch so expensive? I can't tell you why the watch is so expensive. There's obviously enough demand for the product. I like to compare it to modern art. So you can you can understand a Sistine Chapel while wow, Michelangelo, correct me, yeah. Yeah, Michelangelo painted that. You look at that and you're in awe, right? It's the same thing as looking at, at a Patek. It's a, it's a tested product over many, many generations, right? right? So you understand 
understand the value of Patek. The Richard Mille to me is a Jackson Pollock. It's a, a great it's, it's a Matisse. Yeah. It's something that is, if, if you don't understand it, it's very hard to explain. When I look at modern art or a Roscoe, I say, hey, there's two colors on a wall and they look red and blue to me. Why is this worth a hundred right. million dollars? I don't understand that, but there, but it allures me. It's like captured the attention of watch collectors and the market in a way that nobody else nobody has else. been able to. RM has just, for whatever reason, has been able to do that in comparison to other brands. So that's that's what RM is to me. It's when you look at the piece, you know, they don't everything that they engineer is catered to sport. It's catered to the racing machine on the wrist, which is their original marketing campaign. And they've they've stuck to their branding, they've they've stuck to their to their culture and then here we are today. So I think it's pretty clear from our conversation, the main factor that has contributed mostly to Richard Mill's success is the incredible marketing, right? Great. I think we've also established, you know, that they're pioneers in the use of alternative materials. They've done things in terms of complications, the mechanics of things. Mm -hmm. They're extremely well-built watches made by Renault Poppy. We don't have to get into it, but the mechanics are there, the substance is there, and the marketing, right? It's been featured, you know, on the wrist of all celebrities, actors, uh, all this stuff has definitely contributed to it, right? Now, again, we've talked about a little bit about the future of Richard Mill. What would you like to see from them in the future that will continue to contribute to their success? First and foremost, what I would like to see is uh, what they do with their partnership with Ferrari. So prior to Ferrari, they had a partnership with McLaren, and prior to McLaren, they had a partnership with Lotus. Every watch they made for those car brands was an absolute success. My favorite watch for the longest time was the Arm 11 Lotus. So it was an all black watch, it had gold accents and it had red accents in it. Okay. Okay, so they made it with the NTPT, they made it with, uh, with the gold sides as well. That was their Arm 11. They had a uh, Arm 5001, which I actually sold a few times over. And actually, very funny story with that watch. Uh, the first time I sold the watch, uh, Klein bought it. I shipped it over to Asia, <coughs> uh, to our office over there. And then when he went to pick it up, I get a WhatsApp early in the morning saying, hey man, there's something wrong with the watch. I'm like, no, there can't be. You know, we checked the chronograph, we checked yeah. all the functionality, turbulence was working perfectly, case is immaculate. He goes, no, you don't understand. The G-sensor is not working. I'm like, the what? The G-sensor. Well, I'm like, well, how do you check a G-sensor? Like, I wasn't driving an F1 car. <laughs> yeah. And he shows me on video, he takes the watch and he goes like this, to it, right? And, it, and the needle would have moved. So essentially what happens is that watch measures G-force. Yep. So that was probably my favorite RM Turbion that they ever created. With Ferrari, we have yet to see anything spectacular. They made the plate. I like to call it the plate, the Ferrari yeah. plate, the thinnest watch. Whatever. Which is one of the, I'm sorry, which, one of the ugliest watches me, I've ever seen. Which to me was a massive disappointment because I know based on their their past, what they did with the car brands, and then you take, and then you put it in the right. hands of Ferrari, I was thinking of something absolutely spectacular. Right. Maybe their 7201, make it a Ferrari edition. I mean, know, listen. An, an NTPT with some red or something like that, or their 6501 split second, make a Ferrari edition. Yeah. It will absolutely explode. Crush it, which is crazy, right? Because Ferrari's always been the kiss of death. Yeah. And it just feels like yeah. this is headed to it's, there uh, too, because it's like, oh, this is not Richard Mille at all. I was uh, pleasantly disappointed with uh, with the release of that watch. I have yet to see one on the market. There is absolutely zero demand from on my side of things for the watch. <laughs> yeah, I've never had <laughs> gone that. You know, uh, so I am excited you know, to see what they do with Ferrari. I would like to see them discontinue a few of their watches that they've had on their catalog for quite some time from the likes of the RM30 or the likes of the RM55. They've had them for enough time where I think they can kind of slowly phase them out and, and maybe make something else because I see a lot of new things that they're making and, it, and it's really catering towards a certain market, a certain clientele, yeah. like the smileys and a lot of colors and a lot of variations, which works for them. They sell it to those markets right. and they bring crazy premiums. It Your American like Wall Street yeah. banker guy or executive or it, it doesn't feel like them. Richard Mill. We're going back to the idea of racing machines on the wrist. That is not a racing machine on no. the wrist. No, that is. Uh, uh, I don't want to call it a cash grab, but it it's it, to them to them it's something that attracts a certain crowd, and uh, it just makes. It, and again, it goes back. It goes back to hey. Look at what we can do. We can re release this crazy watch and it's going to sell for X over retail, crazy premium over retail, and we can do it again and again. And that keeps people engaged. Their ability to engage their audience is, is better than any brand I know. If you look at Rolex, if you look at Paddock, and you look at AP, what do they do constantly with their most popular models? Not really a whole heck of a lot. Right. right. They recycle old models, but they're very good at keeping that fine yeah. balance between right. 
not producing something for too long and like underproducing yeah. something at the same time, right? Where you keep customers like really frustrated. I think Richard Miller is gonna find that balance, but they mm -hmm. definitely need to find it. I think that's a great point. So guys, that's our thoughts. Any closing remarks, any thoughts on what you think the future of Richard Mill is? Or I think, I, I really do think they have a bright future. Um, I think that they have put their stamp on the watch industry, that yeah. they are at the forefront of the uh, modern art side of things, right? I'm right there with you. I think I'm going to go back to something that you said earlier, which was the idea of being a racing machine on the wrist, right? What made Richard Mill so great, at least initially in my opinion, was that innovation. I think they've strayed away from that innovation, be it in their complication, the use of alternative materials, all that stuff. They've kind of become a, a little bit more conservative, which I don't like because Richard Mill is not a conservative brand or isn't meant to be. Yeah conservative. So I'd love to see them really go again and push the boundaries with respect to what they're doing away from, you know, I guess the smileys and the, the, the stuff that they're doing now, which is colorful and bright, but not necessarily, I would say, what they were known for originally. But guys, yep. let us know down in the comments what you think. I'd really appreciate Adrian solving Thank you for this having video. me. Absolutely. It's always fun talking about RM. The best RM conversations actually don't happen amongst RM enthusiasts. Yeah. It happens amongst people that don't like it. So. The polarizing nature of the brand it. makes it I so it. popular. It adds exactly to the allure of the brand. It, 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 absolutely. Guys, so. be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Again, let us know down in the comments what you think. We'd love to hear from you. And guys, we'll see you in the next one. Take care.